You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello and welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. I am your host, Ray Gerard. With me, Mr. Bob Henniges, our co-host. Bob, hello and welcome again. Good morning, Ray, and Merry Christmas to you. Wonder, wonderful uh, season this this Christmas. I, I heard that's a imp- pretty important time of the year and a pretty important event that we're celebrating. Yeah, it should be Christmas all year round, shouldn't it? Should really should be. It's a it's a great time. Um, yeah. So you know, on this program, we talk about all the things that are wrong, people that are you know doing things in our society that you know are problems and this and that. But Christmas, of course, is is so different. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today deals with oh religious intolerance, and um, so it's you know it's not a happy subject, but uh, you know. If we're dealing with a situation where more and more elements of our society are trying to lean on religious faith, all that means is that we've got to take it internally. Uh, You keep it strong in your home. People might even cherish it more. And in that respect, Christmas may even be, you know, even more special than usual. So we can maybe keep that as our, our goal. Our goal and our hope, and and it is miraculous. I I agree with you. It's every year during the Christmas season, it's so funny to me that the same people that you see all year long all of a sudden seem happier. Their heart is lighter. I think it's no uh, no coincidence that uh, the fact that our Savior was born at this time and the happiness and the joy that that brings is is why this occurs, but it, it really is. I, I see a real difference in people, and it's a neat thing to be around. It is a neat thing. If only they'd stop playing some of those same Christmas songs over and over and over. <laughs> but anyways, and we digress. So this is St. Paul's Letters to America. This is the program that asks, if St. Paul himself were walking the earth, and we're talking about Christmas where God came and walked the earth, what if St. Paul were to come back and walk the earth again and decided, you know what, I better write a letter to those Americans. They're, they need some help. What would he tell us? Well, all you have to do is ask us and we'll tell you. And we've got a letter from St. Paul that we're going to be discussing today. And the context for this letter is, is essentially this. You have God's law, many people believe, and then you have man's law. And the question is, if you lose respect for God's law, will you lose respect for man's law? Now, some people may think, well, of course. And then other people will think, absolutely not. God's law and man's law are two extremely different. They're completely different things. As a matter of fact, you know, the people who believe, like, for example, like Richard Dawkins and uh, other famous uh, agnostics and atheists and secular uh, believers— would say that religious faiths are the cause for all the wars in the world. It's when people argue about God's law and what God wants, that's where you end up with you know the real conflicts that have divided people for centuries. And we get rid of all that, we establish man's law, or man and woman's law, and uh, we'll have a more peaceful world. But the question is, If that's true, then that means that you don't really need God's law. Perhaps there isn't even any God's law. And so the test here is, well, but what if there is a God? What if there is God's law? If that's the case and you deny it, then what would you expect? If you're going to do an experiment, what would you expect the result of that experiment to be? You take away respect for God's law. What do you think might happen? Might it not be the respect for all law? Might it not be an increase in chaos? And can we actually see any evidence for that already happening? Well, as you might guess, since we get to frame the question and set up what we're going to discuss on the program, uh, you're going to be hearing later on some evidence for the fact that, yeah, this is in fact happening. So what is our letter from St. Paul? Um Bob, you have it there in front of you. Yes, I do. How about uh, how about you go ahead and read it for us? This is from uh, from Saint Paul. You who teach another, are you failing to teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? 
You who forbid discrimination, do you discriminate? You who detest intolerance, are you intolerant? You who boast of the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? That's interesting. Now, if you're a biblical scholar of sorts, you may know that Paul's uh, letter to the Romans didn't include tolerance and discrimination. He didn't use those particular words. He used other ones. But the principle is basically the same. Are you being a hypocrite? Are you preaching uh, that people should act one way and then you yourself act another? And if in that, if, and he talks about people who boast of the law. Now, he was talking about Mosaic law, but we can apply it here as well. You know, are, if there were, you know, strictures and rules that, you know, govern your society back in Jerusalem of Christ's day, that would have been Mosaic law. But, uh, you know, if there's a law that governs your society, do you boast of it? And if you do, and then you break it, are you dishonoring God's law? In other words, is there a connection between breaking the law, the law that governs your society, and dishonoring God? Um, you know, Paul thought so. He thought so. You know, if you boast a law, you do these things, you act hypocritically. When you do that, you don't follow these, these rules that govern your society. You dishonor God. It's not that Hey, you know, you're breaking the rules. The rules, rules are rules. So what? I mean, you can change. People can change rules. What's the problem? You know, you're dishonoring God. That was the connection that Paul made. And so, you know, if that's in fact the connection, if there is a, a connection between following the law and honoring God, then if we dishonor God, we may also suspect logically that we would then have a problem with following laws. So let's uh, let's talk about that, shall we? Ray, you know, it's always been my opinion, um, and I've talked with numerous people about this, but each person has a choice. And to me, the first and most important thing is to follow God's direction. If you do that, really good things will happen as far as I'm concerned. But not everybody does. There are some that don't believe in God and don't believe in God's law, and they don't follow that. Then it degrades, and I do believe it degrades, from God's law to what their parents tell them to do. Their parents try to instill in them right and wrong. If you don't listen to God, hopefully parents are still trying to do right and wrong. And I feel like at one point in time, we all listen to God's law. And then there's a point in time where we listen to our parents. And finally, if both of those degrade and people don't listen to that at all, then the society the rules, the laws of the land have to take over in order to keep us from hurting one another. And when we fall to no longer listening to God and no longer listening to our parents and the things that they teach us, and all we do is adhere to the law of the land, we have degraded to such a bad place that we are really going to struggle. And I think that's what you're saying. When we pass by God's law, we are in serious trouble to try to hold ourselves together as a society. And the societies that truly have been with God are the ones that are stable and long-lasting and loving and have a chance. And those that simply have the law of the land are going to struggle, struggle and have difficulty. Yeah, I guess you might just uh, sort of synopsize it like this. If there's no ultimate authority, is there any authority? I mean, what authority would – if there's no ultimate authority, what authority would there be that you would have to respect? And the answer is perhaps not. And I guess if, if we're going to make the case that the answer is no, um, you know, that there is – there is, if there's no ultimate authority, then there is, you know, no authority you have to respect. If that's the case we're going to make, then we're going to suspect that we're going to find evidence of it. So that's what we're going to do in this program. What we're going to talk about is we're going to go back to 1984 and a speech that then Governor of New York Mario Cuomo gave at Notre Dame University. It's a it was a it was a well I guess it was a famous speech at its time and it's continued to be a famous speech and we'll go into that in detail. And then we're going to try to make uh, a connection between that speech in which he uh, he argued that you could be a Catholic politician and still support 
uh, abortion because, in essence, what his argument was is that, you know, I'm, as a governor, I'm a public official and I have responsibility to govern a state that has people of all faiths and all backgrounds, people of religious faiths, people who are not religious. And to accommodate all of these people in a pluralistic society, I have to do what the people want. And if most of the people want abortion, then I follow abortion. So that was his argument that, you know, I can be a politician and I can be Catholic. I can be Catholic in my private life. I can be a pro-choice politician in my public life. That was his argument. We'll go into it. And we're going to try to draw the connection between that and a case uh, <clears throat> still pending involving the University of Iowa in which they flagrantly – university officials, the highest the, – the, the high-ranking members of the administration of the university flagrantly disobeyed a court order. Now, you might ask, well, how could you possibly draw a connection between the two? Well, by the end of this program, you, you can tell us how well we did. So first, let's talk about Mr. Cuomo. So he, um, he, when he began his talk, he set out the issue that he was going to try to address as this. He said, must politics and religion in America divide our loyalties? Our loyalties. Does the separation between church and, sh and state imply separation between religion and politics? And he was going to try to argue no, that we don't have to be divided. But the only way he accomplishes that result is to accept a division. Must politics divide our loyalties? If you have a political loyalty and you have a religious loyalty, must they be divided? Or can you join them? Or can, or can you, I guess, maybe be comfortable in your own skin with those divided loyalties? And so the answer that he, that he arrives at, the way he accomplishes this result, is to simply accept the division. As we said, you, know, you can be a pro-choice politician and a Catholic, you know, private individual. Well, there's a problem with that. I mean, to some extent, it's a clever argument. It's not really that clever when you dig into it and expose it for the inconsistencies and the flaws that are, you know, easily found there. But on the surface, it appears clever. Wouldn't that almost be the definition of the word hypocritical? <laughs> well, perhaps so. Um, but like I said, he's he bases it on the fact that he's just following the will of the people. And he's a public – he's a politician. He's a public servant. And he has to follow the will of the people. That's his rationale. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is you accept the division. You uh, buy into the, this division. You allow the division. You don't try to resolve the division. You just let it be. And, you know, there's the rub – because if you have a division between two different things and you have a contest, if there's a, if there's a struggle, a fight, a challenge, and you have a contest and you don't try to get past the contest, you accept the fact that there's going to be this struggle, then there's going to be a winner and a loser. Anytime you sanction a fight, you know, you've got – you know, uh, you know, we've got the world heavyweight champion and the number one contender for the world heavyweight champion's title. And instead of, hey, both you guys shake hands, make peace, and you know, peace, let peace and harmony reign in your hearts, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's no fun. We want to see these guys slug it out. So we sanction a bout, and they fight. Well, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a winner and a loser. And if you say there's religion and there's politics and there's going to be a fight and that's okay that we're going to allow this fight, you know, then there's going to be a winner and a loser. If, on the other hand, you say, hey, we've got religion, we've got politics, why don't we try to marry the two? Now, I understand that there are different religions. And this is not an argument for an official church state. Our country was founded on a very different concept. If the country was founded on the idea, there would be no official church uh, of the country, no official state religion. But that's not the question. The question is not really which religion. The question is religion at all. The fight that we are seeing 40 years after Governor Cuomo gave this speech is not between this religion and that religion. It's between God and no God. 
And that case involving the University of Iowa where they flagrantly um, disobeyed a court order, that's exactly what it was about. That's exactly what it was about. The university is telling people, no God, no religion, can't have it. The university is actually saying that even after a court told them they couldn't do it, even after their own university policy uh, protects freedom of speech and diversity of thought. So anyways, um, but that's that's the first thing that I, I think I would note with, with Governor Cuomo's speech is that he accepts the fact that there will be a fight. We're not going to try to get past the fight. We're going to allow the fight. And in doing that, as I say, he mandates there's going to be a winner and a loser. Now, if this was the idea that was put forth in 1984, and it's been accepted by people, um, and you'll hear, you hear it a lot these days. You hear it a lot these days. Um, you know, we can't, um, you know, we can't, um, as a society, force our religion on other people. Uh, you know, we have to allow, you know, all schools of thought, et cetera, et cetera. And you hear that all the time. Uh, anytime anybody comes forward with some kind of a religious thing, hey, you're saying Merry Christmas. Hey, you've got a nativity scene on the village green. You're forcing your religion on somebody else. You know, hey, you've got Christmas lights up. You're forcing your religion on me. Hey, you've got a cross in a public in a cemetery for you know veterans who died in war. You're forcing your religion on the public. I am offended. You have a school play where you know the Charlie Brown Christmas pageant is taking place, and you know one of the you know one of the the, the, the characters in the play is going to recite those lines from Linus where he describes you know what Christmas is all about, and he quotes the Bible. And people get upset and say, you can't do that. You offend me with your religion. We hear this all the time. Um, But, you know, that's not the fight. The fight is not which religion. The fight is whether or not there's God or no God. There are certain things that all the major religions, you know, tend to agree on for the most part, you know, and it— they generally, the principles are, you know, uh, peace, not violence. Um, and, of course, if you want to see a breakdown of, of law and order, you want to see a deterioration for respect of the law, just look at what's been happening in our cities over the course of this last year where you've got riots. And not only have you got riots and buildings being burned and, you know, minority business owners having their lives ruined uh, because the insurance, you know, they, they get their businesses burned out and then the insurance isn't enough to cover it and so on and so forth. Um, but you've got governors and mayors not enforcing the law. When they take office, they take oaths of office. They take oaths to enforce the law. And then they don't do it. Is that respect for the law? Um, so anyways. Um, well, Ray, one of the things that I see, and I obviously am – just a bit biased myself and my love for the Catholic Church. But when we talk and we disagree about some law or some part of the law, the answer almost always comes back. I don't remember a time when it wasn't, yes, this is the law. Yes, we can oppose it through speaking out. But we don't ever, that I know of, encourage breaking the law and hurting others. Instead, we, we can peacefully assemble. We can go together and talk. And we chat with others about that we disagree. But it's not about forcing something through violence to happen our way. When we pray, we pray for the leaders of our community and the leaders of our state and our country. And if we disagree, we bring that to their attention, but we don't force our way. And that is because we believe in God first. And we believe in the laws, right? And we believe it's appropriate to follow both. So we will never give up God's law. We will try to change our law to be something that's reasonable and fits with God's law, but we won't force that change. We will try to do it lovingly and peacefully and to tell people. And that seems like the huge difference. Rather than telling people and forcing them to do what you want, rather than asking, telling them, letting them know what God really wants and means, 
and help them with that. Yeah, I mean, if if and if there's an ultimate authority, if there's a higher authority, then you understand you're both under it, and then you don't try. There, there's an element of humility that, that's part and parcel of that, and you don't try to force other people to bend to your will because you know you're both going to get judged by that higher authority. At least that's that's the idea. Um, now, um, <laughs> it's interesting, Mr. Cuomo, in this very speech, said. That God doesn't insist on political neutrality. He's in the very speech where he's talking about keeping his religion out of politics. He admits the principle that he doesn't have to be politically neutral in, from a religious perspective. God doesn't insist on that. I mean this is, this is I think what characterizes a lot of these arguments that end up denying God or putting God in, in second place. And look, I'm uh, – I'm not here to try to judge the the faithfulness of, of Governor Mario Cuomo. I think he was trying to come up with um, some type of, a, of an argument where he could justify his obligations and loyalties to his political party and loyalties to his family and his church, and he was trying to perhaps do the best that he could. The question is not about Governor Cuomo. The question is about his ideas. Do they make sense? Do they have inherent weaknesses? And – what, we're, what I can, you know, what we what we can point out, what we can see in Governor Cuomo's arguments, is the same thing we see in a lot of these arguments, which try to either deny God or put him into second place, and that is they're inconsistent. You know, we love St. Paul's writings because they're consistent. They are still around after two thousand years. There's a cohesiveness between what he writes in one letter and what he writes in another letter, there's something that ties it all together. And it's because they're not his ideas. They're, they're you know, they're inspired, inspired ideas. They're inspired from that higher authority we're talking about. But anyways, I mean, he's only trying to, you know, mimic what he heard from Christ, mimic what he learned, what people have taught him, that just, you know, the apostles taught him about what Christ said. He's only trying to follow. He's not trying to make it up on his own. And but, we, we've been doing that for generations. We've been you doing know, that for generations. If, if, I, if I look at what I read this morning as I went through my prayers, and now for the Catholic Church, like the Jewish community before, we read the Psalms, and we read a lot of them. And that is God's word, right, through various individuals and prophets and those words are timeless, just like St. Paul's words are timeless, for the exact reason you point out. And the Jewish community and the Catholic community use these to try to get our head in the right place, and that is that those words are timeless. They're as true today as they were before. And it's, and it's because they're tied, they're tied to, to, you know, uh, what we heard from Christ. They're tied to God himself, the guy who, who rose from the dead and was seen by 500 people after he rose from the dead. They, yeah, that guy. Um, well, here's another one. Uh, there's, there's just, so that's one small and consistently. Let's give you another one. Uh, he quotes, he talks about a guy uh, called Fishhooks McCarthy. So Governor Cuomo talks about Fishhooks McCarthy. He says he was a famous Democratic leader on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, right-hand man to uh, Governor Al Smith at the time, uh, a Tammany Hall politician. He said Fishhooks, the story goes, was devout, so devout that every morning on his way to Tammany Hall to do his political work, he stopped in the St. James Church on, the, on Oliver Street in downtown Manhattan, fell on his knees, and whispered the same simple prayer. Oh, God, give me health and strength. We'll steal the rest. Now, Governor Cuomo, I guess, cites this little story about Fishhooks McCarthy. Somebody who, I guess, achieved a solution where he could divide his politics and his religion. But look what he's talking about. He's a corrupt politician. We'll steal the rest. It's obviously meant as a joke. Um, I mean, it's funny. Hey, you pray to God. Hey, God, give me strength and health, and I'll, you know we'll steal the rest. Yeah, I mean, why are you quoting this guy? I mean, Mario Cuomo is um, wasn't it was a lawyer, and as a lawyer, he just made the case against himself. Here you've got a guy who says he's following, who thinks he's devout, who goes to mass every day, who maybe believes he's following God's law at least. Most of the time, some of the time, but he he's okay with stealing. 
Now, okay, well, you're a politician. Well, you steal. They don't really steal. They're just stealing. There's, you know, I mean, what? I mean, you're, you're serving the public good. I mean, you you know, um, he, he was a joke about stealing. He didn't really mean that he was stealing. Come on. It's Tammany Hall politicians, Lower East Side. I mean, here's a guy's making fun of stealing. I mean, you're talking about corruption being okay, even in jest. And he's quoting, I mean, he's citing this guy in his argument. You know, and it's the only way that this guy achieves his solution to the division between religion and politics is to buy the, the division, to allow the division, to accept the division. I'll pray to God in the morning. I'll steal in the afternoon. Uh, yeah. And that's the same solution Cuomo comes up with. And it has to be the only solution because the whole reason for the speech was for, by Governor Cuomo was the abortion issue. How can a Catholic governor be okay with abortion? And his speech was regarded at the time as such a light bulb because he answered the question, and you could do it. The bottom line is, no, you can't. You really can't. Um, I think what these two folks are in essence saying is the ends justify the means, that what I really need to do is get to a certain end, and if in order to do that I do things that are wrong or corrupt, like stealing, that's okay, and yet, when you read St. Paul's letter this morning, or when I, when I read it, excuse me, <laughs> when I read St. Paul's letter this morning, it basically said that is not correct. You cannot tell people to do X and then do Y. You can't tell people to do what's right and then do what's wrong. He was very clear in that. And what Fishhooks and Cuomo are saying together is, I can do anything I want as long as I'm trying to get the right answer. And that's dangerous, really dangerous. So let's expand on that point. Let's follow that point. Um, now, he says, um, you, know, you know, Cuomo's talking um, about advocating uh, for, um, you know, uh, advocating pro-life causes in, uh, in concert with the church. And he says, nothing prevents him in his private life from doing that. I am free to do so. The bishops are free to do so. Reverend Falwell, famous um, evangelical leader at the time, is free to do so. The Constitution guarantees your right to try. That's what's beautiful about our country. But then he says, but should I? Is it helpful? Is it essential to human dignity? Does it promote harmony? Does it promote harmony? Or does it divide? We live in a pluralistic society, he says. So he says, when should I argue to make my religious value your morality, my rule of conduct your limitation? So this is this, is this argument, again, that he's, that he's making, that there are other people who believe in, believe in abortion, and as a politician, he's got to, um, he's got to allow for that. Uh, but there's a false assumption here. Um, he's talking about different people in a given society. Some people believe in abortion. Some people don't. And there's freedom in this country, so we should allow you know, people the freedom to have abortions because otherwise we're foisting our religious notions on them. Of course, even that is a fallacy because you know, if you think uh, abortion is wrong from a religious perspective – you know, maybe it's simply because you uh, believe this idea that killing is wrong and, you know, that, you know, an unborn child uh, is entitled to life just as well as anybody else. Well, we make that – we make that as a society, you know, we say murder is wrong. We've got laws on our the books of our country. Murder is wrong. Where would the country be if we didn't have that on the books? And we said – Hey, you want to have freedom? We're, we're a democracy. You're free to do what you want. You're free to murder. Or if we say murder is illegal, am I foisting my religion on you? So it's a false premise. But the problem is even further than this, and it's this. He's 
the whole basis for his argument is that he's got people within the population of the state of New York that are different. It's a pluralistic society, and you have to allow for both. Okay. So what he's saying is societies can be divided. But then he's making a jump. Because societies can have different people in them, because societies can be divided, then he, as a politician, has to divide himself between the two. He wants – he's making himself – part individual, part politician, a mirror of his society. Well, there's a problem with that. How can you divide a single person? That is the definition of hypocrisy. You are dividing yourself. I mean, you know, as Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You can't be divided between God and man. You can't serve God and man at the same time. That's what Mario Cuomo is actually arguing for, to divide a man an individual person between God and man, between his duties to God and his duties to man. And it's a problem because it abides, it not only accepts this division, as I said before, you know, that his whole argument accepts the fact that there's a division. Well, that division is in society. Now he's, he's taking the division inside his very self and trying to justify it. And that's a logical leap. Because societies are divided, individual people need to be divided. And if individual people are to be divided, if we're to take our own person, our own identity, our own self, and divide that, I mean, we're going to be inherently chaotic. And now we begin to perhaps see where this leads. If this type of thinking, this type of philosophy, this type of view of people is to take hold, then you're going to have an internal chaos. And if you have internal chaos, then you're going to have a situation where people will flout the laws of society. Why Why should I follow some rules or some laws if I myself can go in two different directions at the same time? There's a consistency between the disorder. There's a consistency to this inconsistency. I mean, it leads – I mean, if you take a divided society and make divided individuals, you can, you can then see that if you get a whole society full of divided individuals, guess what you're going to have? You're going to have a divided society. That's why the whole idea of a divided society is problematic. If you say we have to take religion out of the public sphere – and you buy into this division, this struggle between God and no God, um, and we just put God to the side, you're going to end up with divided individuals, and then you're going to have an even further divided society. We have a situation now where people have been saying for the last four years, this country is you know, more divided than ever. Well, this is why. Ideas uh, take time to percolate and to grow and to uh, develop even deeper. And these ideas from Mr. Cuomo, you know, have been around since 1984, and they're working, you know, it, it's not surprising to see the results of this. You could almost, for, you know, foresee, forecast that this is what's going to happen. If you buy into divided societies and, and then buy into divided individuals, how are you going to have any unity out of that? Well, Ray, you know, one of the things that I think our country was founded on and one of the things that I think is truly the right thing is for a politician who is going to represent you to be clear in his or her viewpoint and let people know what that viewpoint is and then go ahead and choose. And so you have people running against each other for your vote and you want to clearly know what they truly believe and then choose between those two. But in order for politicians to be successful, they've decided that you don't want to tell anybody clearly what they believe. They want to make this ambiguity sit where all they do is sort of sit in the middle so that the most people that they can would follow them. And I think that's the issue. People are trying to confuse and they end up being some hodgepodge of lots of different ideas without consistency instead of being consistent 
and being strong and letting people know what they believe. If you want to understand this a little bit deeper, watch any communication with a politician, a debate or anything else, and a clear question is asked. The chances of that question being answered are one in a million. The politician instead says whatever they want about whatever topic they desire, right, rather than letting people know how they It changes feel. from one week to the next. And it changes. <laughs> so, so that's exactly what a skilled politician does. They, they don't let people know where they're at. They want everyone to love them and vote them in because of all the different things that they might believe instead of truly saying, here's where I am. And St. Paul said, here's where I am. God says, here's where I am. They weren't faking, lying, hiding. They were right out in front of everybody. It cost both of them, Jesus and St. Paul, their lives. But it was true, and the ideas they had 2,000 years ago are still true today. So, now we've... um, um yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a difference here between these ideas of St. Paul and the ideas that uh, Mr. Cuomo. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope his ideas don't last for 2,000 years. Um, so we've just barely sort of scratched the surface of this, this speech. We could talk about it and go into more and more, you know, of the, the arguments and the problems with the argument and so on and so forth. But – you know, we've touched, touched some of the, the main points, and I think we've shown that there is a philosophical, a deep, foundational philosophical inconsistency. Number one, you buy division. Number two, you divide individual individuals, single individuals. But let's, let's go on because uh, we can take too much time on that, and we don't have that much time. Um, we talked about the University of Iowa at the outset of the program. Okay, where does that fit in? Okay, here's what's happening at the University of Iowa. There was an organization called Business Leaders in Christ. It was a student organization. Like, like at other universities, these student organizations have to apply to the university for recognition. In the case of the University of Iowa, when you get recognition as a student organization, you get certain discounts um, on catering and, and, and other things. Uh, you get the right to use school facilities. You get the right to use uh, school communication channels. Uh, you get a variety of different things. Um, if you're decertified, obviously you get none of that. Now, the university's got hundreds of these organizations, and uh, Business Leaders in Christ was one of them, and they got decertified. And uh, so they sued. They said, you know, we're being discriminated against because we're business leaders in Christ. We have a religious affiliation, a religious connection. You're discriminating against us. You allow a lot of other organizations, um, and are, you're applying different standards to us. You're allowing others that have the same problem you decry in us. Um, basically, the problem is that you're exclusionary, that you only want Christians in, in your organization. So, you know, you're discriminatory, you're exclusionary, you're decertified. problem with it is they have all kinds of other organizations that are discriminatory to some extent. You have a male fraternity, only males. Uh, you know, female sororities, only females. Female sports clubs. You got Republican, uh, you know, campus groups and Democratic campus groups for only Democrats and only Republican. Lots of different organizations of that same same nature. So why no business leaders in Christ? Well, um, that was the question that was put before a U.S. federal court in the state of Iowa, and there was a judge there it was appointed by um, uh, President Obama who ruled on that case. Uh, If I can find her name, I'm not so sure I can right now. Anyways, uh, so she ruled in this case and said the university was wrong. They violated the constitutional rights of the students that wanted to be part of business leaders in Christ. She ordered them to reverse their decision. Okay? That order from the court came down in January of 2019. In June of 2019, the university did it again with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, another Christian, or, another Christian organization. They did it again. Another lawsuit. Now, you would think that if the court – if they get an order from a court that says this is the law, that 
as a university, you would try to follow it. Uh, you would respect the authority of the judge. Uh, maybe the judge knows more about the law than you do. They didn't. Um, apparently, they had a discussion with their general counsel, and the general counsel told them, hey, one of the things the courts was concerned about is the way you apply the rules inconsistently. Part of the policy of uh, the university, uh, if I can find it, uh, was you know to – uh, well, for example, um, so part of the university's published policies for reg- registration of student organizations was a respect for the free choice of members. I'm quoting now from their policy. The, the university's own policy, which they say they're going to uphold. Hey, do you say one thing and then do another? Um, it was respect for you know the, the ability of people, the free choice of the members – on the basis of their merits as individuals, without restriction, without restriction, free choice of the members to associate with who they want without restriction. And, uh, you know, the policy clarifies that these student organizations are not an official arm of the university. You know, they can be who they want to be. Um, You know, it prohibited uh, discrimination. It said in no aspect of the university's program for certifying, certifying these organizations shall there be differences in the treatment of persons because of race, creed, color, religion, national origin, age, sex, disability, genetic information, etc. Okay. No intolerance. No discrimination. You know, the letter that you know Bob read from St. Paul talked about discrimination and tolerance. Well, we got a little liberal with our language there. We transposed some words. He talked about some other things. Um, but uh, but the principle still applies. Are you saying one thing and doing another? Their policies, their published policies, mandated respect for uh, religion. Um, it The policy even declared that consistent with state and federal law, the published policy of the university mandated that reasonable that accommodations would be made for religious practices religious practices consistent with it was an acknowledgement of state and federal law requiring that well if you're going to make an accommodation for people to practice their religion could you not at least allow a student organization to have the meetings that they want to have how much of an accommodation do you have to make to let these people do what they want to do? Just let them be. Um, but anyways, nevertheless, the uh, the university uh, decertified the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in a matter of just a few weeks. They sent them uh, a demanding letter on June 1st of 2019 or 2018, I think. Anyway, saying, uh, you know, hey, you've, you've got to um, change your – your charter, so that you allow non-Christians. Um, and the charter for the organization allowed non-Christians in their membership. They welcomed everybody. But they insisted, the charter insisted that leaders of the student organization um, be adherents or followers or believers in the Christian faith. That's what the university had a problem with. So uh, the organization came back and made a proposal to the university and said, well, how about we change our charter so that all we say is that we encourage our leaders of our organization to be members of the faith. We just encourage it, but we don't require it. The university said no. I mean, the organization was uh, acquiescing. They were conceding. They were giving up part of what I'm part of their identity. They were giving up, you know, part of who they who they were and what they wanted to be. They were willing to concede even that to the university. And the university still said no. What was the problem with this organization? Well, the lawsuit pointed that out because what the lawsuit found was that, hey, at the same time that this 
organization was decertified. The university went and decertified some other organizations. At the same time, they were allowing a whole bunch of organizations to uh, continue to exist. They decertified at the same time a bunch of others. Guess who they were? The Chinese Student Christian Fellowship, the Geneva Campus Ministry, the Imam Mahdi Organization, the Latter-day Saint Student Association, the Sikh Awareness Club. Gee, what do these organizations have in common? They're religious. Um, The complaint filed on behalf of this organization by the Beckett Foundation said, a religious group denied religious leadership will ultimately cease to be religious. And the university knows that. That was the problem. They were religious. We have to get rid of the religion. I mean, that's, that's what's involved. Oh, by the way, this organization was involved in all kinds of charitable activities, fundraisers for places that provided jobs to kids with special needs, uh, hunger banquets for you know world poverty. They were the for six of the last seven years. They were the top you know fundraiser for that purpose. And you know I could go on and read some of the other charitable things they did. So much so that in the spring of 2006, because university has been on campus for 25 years. This is not an organization, by the way, that was just applying for new status. They had been on campus for 25 years, but now they were a problem. They hadn't changed. There's nothing new about them. You know, we talked about the consistency. You, Bob, you're talking about consistency. We talk on this program about the consistency of St. Paul's letters and his ideas and his principles down through millennia. 25 years, the university couldn't be consistent. In 2006, this same organization got an award for its outstanding from the university for its outstanding services to the student body. Not only were they allowed, they were given awards. They were a model. But now they can't be allowed to exist. Why? So, anyways, guess what happens with this lawsuit? Because InterVarsity sued the university as well. And guess what happens? They go before the same judge. How about that? Because she's the sitting judge at the U.S. District Court for this, you know, for this, this section of, uh, of Iowa. So anyways, I can, I can smell that this is not going to end well. <laughs> it's not going to end well. So guess what happened? They not only sued the University of Iowa, but they sued Bruce Harold, president of the University of Iowa. They sued Melissa Shivers, vice president for student life. They sued William Nelson, associate dean of student organizations. They sued Andrew Kutcher. Coordinator for Student Organization Development. They sued Thomas Baker, Student Misconduct and Title IX Investigator. They not only sued the university, they sued a bunch of the of the people, the people at the university who were responsible for this. Well, in light of the fact that their own university policies mandated what it mandated. And they chose not to follow that. Um, You could expect this might not go well, especially since just barely a few months earlier, they had gotten a direct order. The same university from the same court had gotten an order that what they were doing was illegal, and they did it again. So what happens? So the judge said, and by the way, these administrators understood and interpreted the prior court order as mandating uh, that these organizations be allowed. They understood this. So the judge now has to rule on the second case and says, as he says of, the, of these defendants, he says, Dis, uh, she said, despite their accurate interpretation of the prior court order, Shivers, Nelson, Kutcher, and others um, – proceeded to broaden enforcement of the human rights policy in the same in the name of uniformity, applying extra scrutiny to religious groups in the process, while at the same time continuing to allow other groups to operate. Um, the court does not know how a reasonable person could have concluded this was acceptable, as it 
plainly constitutes the same selective application of the human rights policy that the court found constitutionally infirm in its prior order. The court found them in the prior order guilty of what was what's known in the law as viewpoint discrimination. It is clearly unconstitutional. You apply a rule based on what somebody thinks, what their beliefs are. It's their viewpoint that you discriminate against. Well, we're supposed to have freedom of speech, freedom of thought, you know, freedom of religion. We're supposed to have freedoms in this country. If you discriminate, if you use your power and authority to discriminate based on what people believe, that's not really American. They found it unconstitutional the first time. They knew that it was still going to be unconstitutional, but they did it a second time. So guess what happened? The judge said, normally university officials have immunity from personal liability for monetary damages. They don't have to open their own individual wallet and pay the plaintiffs for their damages. This, now this, and, the, and the court in that first case said they're entitled to that immunity. In the second case, the judge says, that's gone. That's gone. You can't hide behind that. You violated the law. You knew you were violating the law. These people have a right to sue you personally. What you have here is a lack of respect for the law. And the court is just trying to find a way to make these people respect the law. And they're going to have to come down harder on them. If they don't respect the law on their own, we're going to have to come down harder on them. Maybe if it comes out of their own pocket, they won't do it again. This is what's happening. So, question. How is this happening? Why would, that, why, would, why would university administrators ever do this? Why would you ever do this? Answer. Because you can divide your loyalties. Because you can divide... You can divide anything you want to divide. Now, if you can divide yourself in half, you know, you can divide yourself apart from a court. You don't have to respect the law. I'm a university. I'm, you know, we, it's like a ship at, this, at, at, at sea. You know, we can do what we want here within our grounds. But, but the law says different. The law says, no, courts have jurisdiction over you. But if, if you buy into the notion that societies can be divided, then we can divide it any way we want. We can divide our loyalty so that we don't have to listen to courts. Why should we have to listen to a court? Uh, the court's wrong. The court's wrong. There's no ultimate authority. There's no right and wrong. We can do you – know, I mean, if you can allow – well, I, you know, I mean, this, this is the philosophical problem. Once you buy into these ideas that we can pick and choose what we believe and who we are, as a single separate person, we can divide who we are. We can certainly divide our societies. And we can divide our societies more and more to the point now where we've got universities dividing themselves from the authority of a court and saying we don't care. It's respect for a higher authority. Once you get rid of respect for a higher authority – then all forms of higher authority can be disrespected. If you don't respect God, why are you going to respect the court? Judge so-and-so? Who is she? I don't care. I'll do what I want. They're tied together. These things are tied together. You know, there's, there's an element of humility that is extremely lacking with these university officials. They don't need to be humble. There's nobody they have to answer to. We can do what we want. We will have a more and more divided country the more we buy into this kind of thinking. I can't imagine um, the kind of crazy thought process that would go into someone coming up with this final solution that would allow them to get that way, except, in my opinion, ridiculous arrogance. I am so important and so correct in the way I think I refuse to listen to anyone, and I will enforce this on others. Many people believe as they want to believe, but then to go out and force others to believe as they believe is a huge decision. And these folks made it, and obviously they paid the price for that. 
makes all the sense in the world that this judge would be rather twerked off and begin not to accept the immunity these, that these people had been uh, blessed with, and, but instead to actually go after them to make sure that they will truly listen the next time. I guess if, if you don't make it painful enough, they're not going to listen. And that's, in essence, what this judge did, which makes all the sense in the world. But again, the point you made early on and the point that I think is, is absolutely wonderful is that if we don't respect God, if we don't respect God and his law, if we don't respect the way he made our universe to exist, we are going to have serious trouble. We are going to be in deep trouble. And I firmly believe that it is important for each one of us to truly get to know who our maker is and to love him with all of our heart and respect what he gives us. And if we do that, if we each do that, we're going to be much better off. We also have to realize that we are not judge. God is judge. We are not. Therefore, we need to respect other people and allow their, them to have their opinions and listen to them. And all of that is important because we are not the ruler. We have to stay within the bounds of our nation and the laws that are put together here. I'll tell you what, Bob, how about you continue that with maybe a closing prayer for a little bit more harmony, a little more humility, perhaps. Anyways, perhaps you can give us a closing prayer. You bet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to live and think about what you desire. Allow us always, even if we have something we really, really, really want, to understand that if it is not in communion with you, it is not right and it is not good. Allow us always to try to do the right thing, but not to judge others to allow people to think their own thoughts and come up with their own decisions and allow us to simply verbalize in a kind and loving way what we think you are telling us. Especially in this season of Christmas, Lord, let us embrace the Christ child, your son who came down to earth, and allow us to love him with all our heart and take our words from him. When he was on earth, he did not tell us to go out and enforce what you want, not to judge, but to be loving to God and allow us to stand on that. We pray all this in the wonderful and joyous season of Christmas and allow us always to know that God sacrificed himself, came here, and it is our only job to follow him and to love him with all of our heart. We pray this all in the wonderful and glorious name of that Son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the the Father, Father, and the the Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit. amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And uh, until next time, God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece, and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.